We'll be in Genesis chapter 3 this morning. If you've been married any matter of minutes, you understand. We'll try to fix that. I don't know. We'll get it there. If you've been married any matter of minutes, you understand conflict is a part of marriage. I heard about this couple. They'd been married 60 years. And on the day they got married, they said, we don't want to keep any secrets from one another, but the wife asked for one favor. She kept a box on the top of her closet, and she asked her husband, she said, I just want to ask you to do me a favor. Don't ask me what's in this box. Don't ever look at this box. And for 60 years, her husband honored that commitment. But she was dying, and he was getting her things in order, and he'd even forgotten about that box. But as he was going through the closet, going through her stuff, he found that box, and so he asked her, he said, look, I, can, we, can we open this together before you pass away? And, and she, she consented, so he brought the box to the hospital there where she was, and they opened it, and inside the box were two crocheted dolls and a roll of bills totaling $95,000. And he said, what is the deal with this? She said, well, the day before we got married, my grandmother told me. She said, you're going to have a lot of arguments in your marriage, and what you need to try and do is come to a resolution. But if you can't come to a resolution, you just keep your mouth shut and you crochet yourself a doll. And, and you just work that anger out through that. And the husband begins to cry because here they are, 60 years they've been married. And there are two crocheted dolls, two arguments in their marriage that didn't come to resolution. And he just thought, oh, how beautiful. He said, well, what's the deal with the $95,000? She said, well, when I got enough of them, I'd take them down to the flea market and sell them for $5 a piece. <laughs> I heard about one woman. She and her fiancé have been married three days, and she calls the preacher, and she's just crying. She says, Preacher, we had our first fight, and I'm just so upset. And the preacher smiled, and he said, Look, every couple needs to have their first fight. It's not that big a deal. She said, I know, but I need to know what to do with the body. Conflict is a part of marriage. But what we need to do as Christians, what we need to do as those who are working towards healthy marriage, is we need to really learn two things. One is we need to diagnose the source of the conflict. And secondly, what we need to do is we need to decide how we're going to deal with the conflict. To simply bury our heads in the sand, to act as if the conflict isn't there, to ignore it, to move past it. Those are all naive and foolish and frankly won't work. What we need to do is we need to try and say, what is the cause of this conflict in our marriage? What, what is the root of it? And how is it that moving forward we're going to deal with it? And in Genesis chapter 3, we see... The, the root of this conflict. We've been looking back at Genesis. Remember, God created marriage. Marriage belongs to God, but sin, through sin, we broke marriage. So we need God to fix marriage, right? We need God to restore it. We need God to, to enable us to have these marriages that honor Him. And in Genesis 3, just a few verses after the very first marriage ceremony you have the first conflict in marriage. Look with me in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat any of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, We may not eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the trees that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. 
But the serpent said to the woman, you shall surely, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that, there was de- that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was, desire- was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So here you have Adam and Eve in the garden. Here they are, and in chapter 2 it tells us they were naked and not ashamed. But in chapter 3, sin enters into the picture. And with sin comes conflict. And by the end of this section, they have clothed themselves, they have covered themselves, they have hidden themselves from each other. There's conflict in their marriage. Adam is later going to go and he's going to try and blame Eve for the problem. There is this conflict because of sin. And what you and I need to understand is that the biggest conflict in marriage is not man versus wife. It's the desires of the flesh versus the desires of the spirit. The biggest source of conflict in marriage is not your spouse. It's your own heart. All of the conflict in marriage arises out of our own sinfulness. We like to blame our partner. We like to point fingers. We like to accuse them. We like to think if they did things differently, if they approached life differently, if they acted differently, if they used a different tone, we wouldn't have any of these issues. But what you see in Adam and Eve is that problems did not arise from without. That is, they didn't attack each other first, but the problem arose from within. They were tempted. They began to doubt God. They began to question themselves and they began to to reject God's will for their life. And that included God's will for their family. And because of their doubt, because of the sinfulness that crept up and spilled out from their hearts... Then conflict began between the two of them. See, we try to blame our spouse and sometimes we even try and fix our spouse. Can I just tell you right now, let me speak to people who aren't married. You cannot fix anyone else. Don't you dare get married thinking, well, I'll change them. Can I tell you, you can't and you won't. A lot of times people will say, they'll come and they'll talk to me. I just can't believe my spouse says this. Well, when did they start? Well, they've always done that. So now you're just now getting upset about it. You married them like that. Why are you just now getting upset about it? Well, I thought I could change them. Well, you can't fix anybody else. And instead of blaming our spouses, instead of saying they're the problem, we need to see that our own heart is the problem. And marriage is the union, right? It's, it's the one flesh union of two different people. It's two lives. It's two hearts coming together. But they're two sinful lives and two sinful hearts. And so what you have is two sinners saying, I do. You have two sinners joining their lives together. And because they're sinners, conflict is always going to play a part in their marriage. See, conflict is the fruit of self-centeredness. The conflict in our marriage is because we are self-centered. Pick any sin you want. Pick any conflict. Pick any argument you and your spouse have. And at the root of it is self-centeredness. Now, if you talk to marriage experts or if you look statistically... Most people will tell you that the number one cause of arguments in marriage is money. But money is not the cause of the argument. How we feel about money is a symptom of our self-centeredness. A study was done a couple years ago and said on average couples fight about money at least three times per month. As couples age, they generally argue about money more often. The most common cause for money arguments, 58% of arguments about money, according to this study, focused on the differing opinions 
of needs versus wants. Just, we've all had that argument, have we not? Somebody, I need to spend my money on this. No, you want to spend your money on that. Here's what we need to spend our money on. And the husband and wife have these differing opinions about what is a necessity for marriage and what's a luxury for the family. I need to go on this trip. I need new golf clubs. I need new, a new dress. I need this. I need that. And again, there's this self-centeredness. That, that spills out into our marriage. 49% of couples argue about unexpected expenses. 32% argue about insufficient savings. 30% of adults who are married have engaged in at least one deceitful behavior related to their finances, such as hiding a purchase or lying about how much they spent on it. Whether it's money, whether it's sex, whether it's children, whatever it is, all those things that tend to cause the arguments in our marriage, all those things that are the source of conflict in our minds, really find their roots in our own self-centeredness. What they, they really find is that it's about I want my way and I like the way I think and I want this to work a way that, that makes sense to me. And all of our conflicts come out of that. Look in Genesis 3.16, where God curses. Look at what he says. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children. Then listen to this. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. What's God saying there? God is saying sin brings with it a plague that is going to infect marriage a plague of self-centeredness. That same language is used in chapter 4 where it says, where God says to Cain, sin is at your door and its desire is to rule over you. Right? What is God saying? God's saying that because of sin, the woman in marriage, the wife, she will, will want to reject the role that God has given her as a helper. She'll want to rule the house, but the husband, he'll want to reject the role God has given him as this humble leader, and he'll want to rule over his wife and domineer her. He'll want to abuse his strength and his position. God says self-centeredness is, is going to be this plague because of sin that is going to infest and destroy families. It is this self-centeredness that caused Adam and Eve to sin in the first place. Eve and Adam said, we want to be like God. We think that that. We are equal with God. We think our opinions are just as valid as His. We think that we should be able to do whatever we want to do. And because of self-centeredness, the first conflict began, and God said pretty much every conflict after that, every conflict after that is going to, to grow out of our own self-centeredness. I mean, just think of, of how arguments typically go in our home. We act in a self-centered way that hurts our spouse and they respond to us in a self-centered way. Whether it's that they respond harshly, that they respond quietly, right? Maybe they're, they're passive aggressive and so they don't say anything, but they know that it really gets at their partner, that it really aggravates them. Maybe they do something to make themselves feel better. They say something cruel about their spouse just, just to try and gain a position of what they feel is, is, is front in the marriage. We do something self-centered. Our spouse responds in self-centeredness. And then the dam bursts. Then there's the arguments. There's the conflicts. There's the anger. All because we... I've turned in on ourselves so much. But what we need to understand is marriage is designed to rid us of sin and self-centeredness. We tend to bring our marriage, into our marriages, we tend to bring our self-centeredness. And our self-centeredness is a way that, that our marriages are damaged. Our marriages get hurt because of our self-centeredness. But the way God has designed marriage 
is to rid us of that. Marriage is designed to free us from that bondage to self-centeredness. Marriage is designed to work out and to work away and to destroy those tendencies in us, to make life about us. Everything the Bible tells us, if we're coming together as one flesh, the husband is to treat his wife as he treats his own flesh. If she is to honor him, everything in marriage is about putting somebody's needs ahead of your own. That God wants to work in us and through us to, to rid us of this plague of self-centeredness in our life. And marriage is the gift he gives us to do that. See, we need to remember whatever else the Bible says about marriage, whatever else the Bible says about roles in the home, your partner is still, according to Galatians 5.13, your brother or sister in Christ, and you are a bondservant to them. And you, your, your goal, and, and you still have this connection to your spouse, not just as husband and wife, but as brothers and sisters in Christ. You're united in, in Him, and you're united together. And since God has designed marriage to picture the salvation he offers us in Jesus Christ, then we have to realize that marriage only works to the extent that I imitate Christ's self-giving love. If God has purpose, right? Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, here's the mystery, here's what I tell you. Your marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Your marriage is a picture of the salvation that Jesus offered. This has been true from the very beginning. And so what, what Paul is saying is God has designed, God has created marriage to paint this picture of the way he loves his people, of the way his people respond to him and interact with him. And so marriage only works if our marriages are built on the same self-giving love that Jesus Christ has shown us. It can't work any other way. Oh, now two people can dwell in the same home together. But marriage only works. Marriage is only satisfying. Marriage is only fulfilling. Marriage is only healthy to the extent that I mirror Jesus Christ's self-giving love. You know, sometimes we look in the Bible for these passages about marriage. And we think, here's the secret. But if we understand that our spouse is our brother and sister in Christ, if our spouse is another human being created in the image of God, then we don't just need to look to those verses that deal with marriage about how to treat them. You know one of the best verses about marriage in all of the Bible? People come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and likewise love your neighbor as yourself. Is that not a secret to a great marriage? Is that not the key to a happy home? If I love Christ, if I love God with everything I am, and I love my wife as I love myself, is that not what marriage is all about? But we all have this pattern in marriage. We get married, and you realize Right, you 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 date and you just think that that your spouse is the most wonderful person in the world. You're totally charmed by everything they do. You're entranced with them. You think that they are the most beautiful, wonderful thing in the world. And then one day it occurs to you they're selfish. And then one day it occurs to you that it has occurred to them you are selfish. And then you begin to rationalize and determine that your selfishness is not as bad as their selfishness. Yeah, I know I do this, but... I know I have a bad temper, but they're the one that get me to that point. I know I don't handle things well, but if they wouldn't do this, then I wouldn't, that wouldn't even be an issue. And we keep coming back to this idea that the problem is not us. We keep thinking, it's not my fault. But the key to marriage, right? if, if I understand 
that marriage is designed to get me rid of my own self-centeredness, then I have to come to the conclusion that I need to treat my own sin and selfishness more seriously than I need to treat my spouse's sin and selfishness. I need to say, the biggest problem in my marriage is me. The biggest problem in my marriage is my own heart. Again, let me remind you, you cannot fix your spouse's heart. Nothing you can do about that. All you can do with your spouse is at best change their actions, but you have no control over their heart. But by the grace of God, you do have control over your own heart. By the grace of God, you can work on yourself. And what you need to do is you need to say, the biggest problem in my marriage is me, and I'm going to deal seriously with my own sin instead of spending all my time and energy focusing on the perceived sin of my spouse, instead of focusing on what I think they need to do differently or what I think they can do better. See, for evil to triumph fully, two things must occur. Two victories must occur. The first victory is that initial act of evil, of wrongdoing. But the second act is when the evil is returned. You see, it's only when we return evil that we reinfuse life into it. But if somebody does something wrong to us and we simply just choose to ignore it and respond in a Christ-like manner to them, then the evil dies. It doesn't continue, it doesn't perpetuate. Our problem is we are so self-centered that when somebody does something wrong to us, we feel like if we're some, that, like we're somehow cosmically slighted and we're going to stand before God one day being so disappointed because we didn't get them back. My dad has a way of knowing how to just needle right at me and say things. And he said to me recently, he said, Michael, I just don't believe we're going to stand before God and have to answer for saying I'm sorry too much. That's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> that wasn't in, that's not the answer I wanted to hear. But it's true. We, we make life about getting even. We make life about having everything we think as just. And, and again, what we mean by that is I just don't want to be slighted. We don't care if other people are. We just don't want to be slighted ourselves. And if I understand that God has put somebody in my life to help me in this process of being more like Christ, then what I need to do is I need to make the I need to understand my flesh is weak and I'm blind to my own sins. If I understand God has put somebody in my life. One of the things that I need to realize is I have a way of rationalizing my sins. And I have a way of ignoring certain sins. And I have a way of calling sin less than sin. But God has put somebody in my life, not as a thorn in my side, but as a necessary help to help me see the sin in my own life, to help me see the self-centeredness and to rid it from me. And we need our spouse, who loves us more than anyone, to show us our weakness because they know us better than anyone so we can be like Christ. I need Sarah to say to me, Michael, I don't think that was the right way to handle it because I know the truth about myself and I know I don't like to admit my own faults and I know that I'm flawed, but I don't think that I am sometimes. And God has graciously put a helper into my life to help me see sin that I might not see myself. Look at what it says there in Genesis chapter 3 again, there in verse 6. I think we missed this part of the verse. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband, who, listen to this, was with her. I don't know about you, but a lot of times I hear the story told and I see it. Eve is off 
and she eats the fruit, and then she goes and takes it to Adam. But that's not what the Bible says, is it? It says she looks at the tree, she desires it, she eats it, and then she gives it to Adam, who was with her. Why in the world does Moses tell us Adam was with her? Why doesn't it just tell us he ate it? Because Moses is trying to tell us Adam should have said, baby doll, don't eat that. God said, don't do that. But because Adam was self-centered, and Adam did not step into the role of spiritual leader that God had given him, that is why Adam is blamed. That's why the Bible says that sin entered the world through one man. Because when Eve took the apple, or took the bite of the fruit, it was because Adam had already failed to obey God. It was because Adam had not been there to assist his partner. He had not stood up to say, don't do that. God told us not to do that. But Adam was complicit in the sin with her, and he was such a weak sissy that he let her be the one to take the fall. Eve, you go ahead and do that first. We'll see what happens. Right? Isn't that what he does? He let her take the bite. And then when he saw she didn't die, he took a bite. He completely gave up his role that God had given him. So we need that, that spouse, we need that partner to help us see sin in our own life and self-centeredness in our own life that because of our self-centeredness, we're blinded to. And you say, Michael, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't want that. I don't want to give my spouse free reign to call out my sin. Remember I said we needed two things. We need to learn the source of conflict. The source of conflict is my own self-centeredness. But we need to learn how to deal with conflict. I think the way we deal with conflict is mercifully. Mercy is the key to being a helpful spouse. Luke chapter 6, Jesus preaches what is referred to as the Sermon on the Plains. It's a lot of the material, not all of it, from the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus preaches it. He says it to a different group. But he concludes it with this statement. Be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. I think that verse needs to be at the center of the way husbands and wives relate to one another. I know it doesn't say, husbands, be merciful to your wife as God is merciful. I know it doesn't say, wives, be merciful to your husband as God is merciful. But Jesus is saying, be merciful to people as God is merciful. And here's what, I, here's what we need to understand. The only way I can be a merciful spouse is if my mercy is rooted in what God has done for me. You cannot just tell somebody, be merciful, because we don't have it in us. The only way we can be merciful is if we have, sh have been shown mercy, if we understand mercy. Think of it like this. You can only afford to be generous with your money if you have money in the bank. It's pretty simple logic, is it not? You can only afford to give somebody money if you have money in the bank. The same thing is true of love. You can only give somebody love if you have, in essence, a, a, a bank of love, if you have love banked in your life. But if all of your love is tied up in your spouse, and your love for them is rooted in, in your self-centeredness and what they do for you and how they act according to what you want them to do, then when they're not responding the way you want, your love bank is empty, is it, isn't it? And you, don't, you can't have, you can't show mercy because you don't have any mercy. You don't have any love. But if my love for my spouse is rooted in the mercy that God has shown me, and I understand how he has loved me, and I understand my marriage is to picture that love to the world around me, then even when my spouse doesn't do what I want, or they disappoint me, or they upset me, because of God's immense love, I've got a lot of mercy to show. I've got a lot of reserves in which to give. So 
we need to realize that, that this call to be merciful only comes in understanding God's mercy. Secondly, we need to understand mercy doesn't change the need to speak truth. What mercy does is it transforms our motivation from the desire to win a fight to the desire to help our spouse be more like Christ. It takes me out of the center and it puts Christ in the center. Being a merciful spouse doesn't mean you ignore sin. It doesn't mean you overlook sin. It doesn't mean you, you don't ever say anything to your spouse about their sin. What it does is it changes your motivation. And you don't point out their sin to wound them. You don't point out their sin to hurt them. You don't point out their sin to feel better about yourself. Because you understand when you act mercifully, it's not about you. It's about Christ, and it's about helping your spouse honor Him. It's about helping your spouse be more like Him. It's not about just trying to make you feel better or them doing what you want. Being merciful says, I'm putting Christ in the center of our marriage, and this is about loving Him through a life of worship. So if I understand that, then I need to think, how is it that I am going to deal with conflict? How can I show mercy in the way I deal with conflict? Three steps. The first step is I think we need to choose the right time. Most of the arguments that happen in our house happen because when something is done wrong, I just want to get it off my chest right then. That I was wronged, you need to know this now, because heaven forbid, if I don't say it now, I'm going to forget about it later. You know, it's okay to wait. It's okay to collect your thoughts before you confront. You choose the right time. If your partner does something and a whole bunch of people are around, then's not the right time to tell them everything you think they're doing wrong. Wait till the two of you are alone. Wait until you can collect your thoughts and say it in a helpful manner. But secondly, you need to confront the right way. You choose the right time and then you confront the right way. Most of the time... I think the problem is not in what we say, it's in how we say it. And what we say gets lost when the way we say it is not helpful. If I speak to Sarah in a harsh tone, she doesn't hear anything I say. Because what she's hearing is my own self-centeredness in the way I'm speaking to her. And my self-centeredness causes her to tune out anything I might say because it doesn't sound like I'm being loving and helpful. So we need to confront the right way. And there's some questions that I think we can ask ourselves. I got this from a book um, by a guy named Dave Harvey, some of these questions. And if you don't have time to write them all down, I can get them to you later. But I, th I, they, I think they're real helpful. First question, have I prayed for God's wisdom and acknowledged my need of his help in serving my spouse? This is huge. Because what this step does, by me praying before I talk to them, what I'm doing is I'm handing this over to God instead of just going in and it being me trying to feel better. I'm praying, I'm asking God for wisdom. Secondly, am I assigning motives? One of the biggest mistakes couples make make when they, when they argue, when there's conflict, is they begin to assign motives to one another. Well, you were just trying to hurt me. You were just trying to do this. You don't know what your partner was trying to do. If we could read each other's minds, we wouldn't be having these fights in the first place. So don't try and assign motives. You can say stuff like, well, it seemed to me or I felt like, but when you're assigning motives, it's usually coming across as self-righteous. That is, my motives were pure. I didn't do anything wrong. It was you who were the evil one. Don't assign motives. Third, are my observations based on patterns of behavior or merely a single incident? 
is, is, is what we're talking about here. It's what I'm praying about, co- confronting my spouse about. Did it just happen one time? Or is it repeated? Is this a pattern in their life? In my, fourth, am I content to address one area of concern, even if I'm aware of several? You do not need to vomit every frustration on your spouse every time you fight. You don't need to share with them everything you think. That's part of the problem. Ladies, can I just give you a hint? Guys, we're real simple. We can't handle more than one thing at a time, really. You really ought to know that by now. And if you come to your husband and you say, I need you to do this, 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 and this, you're lucky if he gets one thing. But you need to say, what is it that my spouse most needs to work on in order to be like Christ? And as you pray about that, share that with them. Fifth, am I committed to be gentle and wound no more than necessary? We would all say it stings when we hear this stuff. It stings when somebody, when our spouse, this person we love and admire so much, tells us, here's an area you're failing in. So we understand there's going to be some hurt caused. But as the one confronting, are you committed to be gentle? Are you committed to say, it's not my goal to wound, it's not my goal to hurt, it's my goal to help. And so in the words I say in my countenance, am I trying to to hurt as little as possible? Am I prepared to humbly offer an observation rather than an assumption or conclusion? Can we give our spouse the benefit of the doubt? Instead of going in and say, you did this, and here's the reason why you did it, and bringing all these assumptions to the table, say, hey, I noticed this. And let's talk about it. You give them a chance to explain themselves. You give, the, you give them a chance to share their heart with you. And maybe you find out that you misread a situation. But here's the final one, and I think the biggest one. Is my goal to promote God's truth or my preference? A lot of our fights happen. A lot of conflict happens because I make my marriage about my preferences. Listen, marriage is about you laying down your preferences. But in coming together to say, look, this isn't, this isn't about my preference. This isn't about what I want. It's about God's truth. And you mercifully, kindly showing them something they need to work on. So we need to choose the right time. We need to confront the right way. And finally, we need to consider the right goal. That is that my spouse and I are united in our pursuit of honoring Jesus. In every conflict, in every argument, in every discussion, however you want to politically kindly refer to fights and marriages, in every one, your goal is not to win. Your goal is not to embarrass. Your goal is to have a stronger marriage as a result of the discussion you're having, and for the two of you to be more unified and more resolute in your desire to follow Christ. In any tone, in any words, in any intent, that do not push towards that goal of a stronger marriage and more faithfully committed Christians, you ought to get rid of. You ought to do away with that. We need to... to, Understand mercy is the key in how we talk to our spouse. Why? Why is this so important? It's because the goal of marriage is sanctification. Marriage is not primarily about happiness or attraction. The reason Paul says that I am to love my wife is so that I present her to God blameless. You can turn over in your Bibles to Ephesians 5, or you can just listen. I'm just going to read briefly what Paul says here. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Hear what Paul says. Paul says, 
Love your wives the way Christ loved the church. Why did Christ love the church? Why do we love our wives? Why is it that we love our spouses? So that we can present them holy and blameless and spotless before God one day. The goal of God bringing two people together is so that as they come together, as they become one flesh, what they do is they bring each other closer to God. She, because of me, and I, because of her, ought to be a better Christian. Sarah, because of me, and I, because of her, ought to be more in love with Christ than the day we got married. Our marriage is a journey of pulling and pushing one another on towards the goals that Christ has for us. It is this journey of of ridding each other of sin and self-centeredness, of helping one another and assisting one another on our journey to do what God calls us to do. But this only happens through time and commitment. You can only make your spouse a better spouse. You can only make them a better Christian if you put in time and commitment. See, the problem is, so often, we say they're not who they need to be, and we cut bait and run. We say, I'm giving up. I'm giving in. When you stood on the day of your wedding, and you said your marriage vows... It was not a declaration of present feelings. It is a pledge of future love. It is not me saying, I am attracted to you. I'm emotionally invested in you. It is saying, I am going to love you so that one day when you stand before Christ, because God's grace through my life has made you more in the image of him, So that one day when I stand before God, because of your involvement and kindness and effort in my life, I am more like Christ because of you. Paul compares the love that a husband has for his wife with the love that Christ had for his people. And what kind of love was that? Jesus did not just love us when we did what he wanted He didn't love us when we earned it or deserved it. But he loved us as we were so that he could make us into who God wanted us to be. And if I see that Paul is tying my love for my wife with what Jesus did on the cross. What did Jesus do on the cross? Jesus looked down from the cross and he saw his sinful creation. He saw them in their abandonment of him. He saw them in their wickedness. He felt the pain of the nails they had placed there. Blood was running down his face because of their cruelty. He heard their words of hatred and he loved them and he stayed. And in the greatest act of love in human history, Jesus saw his sinful, rebellious creation and he stayed on the cross. And if I am going to love my wife, if she is going to love me, if we are going to love our spouses, what it requires is the commitment to stay. It requires the investment of pouring out our life and pouring it into them and getting rid of self and getting rid of all our selfishness. Working on ourselves, saying, I want God to make me the husband I need to be instead of sitting around praying that God makes her the wife she needs to be. It says that I am invested for life because as Jesus says, what God has brought together, let no one tear us under. And if I love my wife the way Christ loves the church, it involves me spending the time and making the commitment to staying and through my love and through my leadership and through my own example of ridding myself of my self-centeredness and selfishness moving towards that day when I pray I can present her before Christ blameless and spotless. That's what marriage is about. 
Let's bow our heads. Father, Lord, we thank you for the love that you displayed for us. We thank you for the love that you demonstrated so vividly there at Calvary. And all the love that you show us, Father, that we fail to recognize. The times you, you bless us and grace us with discipline, with help, with those things necessary to conform us to the image of Christ. Father, I pray that you would rid me of my self-centeredness. I thank you for a wife who so humbly and wisely helps me become more like Christ. May I provide that same blessing and benefit for her. Father, I pray that our marriages would be built on this desire to be more like you. And that even in those moments where things are tough and we don't know what to do and we seem frustrated, Father, I pray that we work on ourselves and we, we try and rid ourselves of that self-centeredness. We understand that we're the biggest problem. And Father, I pray that we, we treat our spouses like the blessings that they are. Pray, Lord, that when these times of confrontation are done, they're done with mercy and with restitution, restoration as the goal. Father, I pray, especially this morning, for any marriage here that is not built on Christ. Because if we have not received mercy, then we cannot show mercy. So, Father, I pray... If there's anyone here this morning and they're asking, what's the problem with my marriage? What's wrong with my marriage? And this morning you show them through your word, the problem is they've not experienced mercy. And they understand that their greatest need for their marriage is not to try harder. It's not primarily to, to, to spend more time. It's, it's to give their hearts to you. And Father, if there's anyone here this morning who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, May they understand the mercy that you offer, the love that you have shown them. And Father, may they give their hearts to you. As we sing this song of commitment, Father, may we commit our lives and our marriages and our homes to you once again. For you to do with whatever is necessary to display your glory and your goodness to all those around us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.